Good morning, ladies, and welcome. We're so happy to have you all here today. My name is Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for this class. Uh, I do want to let you guys know that today starts our final mini-study, okay? And it's Finding Life in Jesus' Death. Um, it covers the lessons of 26 through 28, which means it lasts from today until the 25th of April. We're so happy to have you join us. Please continue to invite your family and friends. They can pick up even, you know, uh, as this study is progressing. Ladies, I am going to bring our substitute teaching leader, Miss Angie Arvilla, to introduce our next announcement. Good morning. Uh, Angie Arvilla, I am your class's substitute teaching leader, and today we do have our leading a small group seminar. So if you have time, we would love to have you. We will have uh, cake and refreshments, um, but we will also be going through leading a small group. So if you are feeling led or convicted uh, to keep on studying this summer, we would love to have you. We have lots of tools and resources to help equip. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Amen, ladies. Don't miss it. This is our final seminar of this study. Praise God. All right, ladies, I am going to uh, pray, and then we will uh, get started on the lecture. The outline will be up for uh, a few minutes. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful. We thank you, Lord. We thank you because you are majestic. You are mighty. You are everything, Lord. We are nothing without you. Lord, we are just so in awe of you. And even on yesterday, we saw your splendor, Lord. We saw your mighty hand work. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you that we can know you in the pardon of our sins. But Lord, we do have to believe and we have to repent and come to know you in the pardon of our sins, Lord. And so if there's anyone in the room who doesn't, I ask today, Lord, that you would prick their hearts, that they would come to know you. And for us that already believe, Lord, let us have a deeper understanding of your word. And may we surrender all to you, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, ladies. So today we're covering uh, chapter 19 of John. And we're going to be looking at the passages and the verses of 31 through 42. We find ourselves at the crucifixion and burial of Jesus Christ. This passage carries profound theological significance, revealing essential truths about the nature of Jesus' sacrifice, the compassion of his followers, and the promise of redemption. So let's look at the historical context here. The events that are described in chapter 19 of John, verses 31 through 42, occurred during the final hours of Jesus' earthly life. He has been crucified on the cross, fulfilling the prophetic scriptures and embodying the ultimate act of selfless love. As the Sabbath approaches, Jewish law prohibits leaving crucified bodies on display, pressuring the Roman soldiers to hurry the death of the condemned by breaking their legs. However, when they come to Jesus, they find him already dead and do not break his legs, fulfilling another prophecy. You can look at Psalms 34:20. So we have two divisions, ladies, and they'll be up. Uh, Jesus' body was pierced, but his legs were not broken. And our second division is Jesus' body was removed from the cross, prepared and buried in a new tomb. As we explore this passage, let us not forget the Lamb of God. Jesus' death on the cross parallels the sacrificial system of the Old Testament where lambs were offered as atonement of sin for sin. Jesus is the ultimate sacrificial lamb whose blood brings forgiveness 
and reconciliation between God and humanity. That's in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. This leads us to our aim today, ladies, and what I hope we learn. Jesus' burial prepares us for his glorious resurrection. Jesus surrendered himself as the perfect sacrifice to absorb God's wrath. His death and burial fulfill God's prophecy and perfect plan as he bore our guilt on the cross. In the horrific scene at Golgotha, where a mocking crowd, weak disciples, arrogant leaders, and hard-hearted soldiers, the Messiah's mangled body provides indisputable evidence of the sinful spiral of humanity's fall and God's judgment. God is and always will be without sin. Adam and Eve initiated humanity's fall in the peaceful and unspoiled garden God had created. We saw that in Genesis 3. Human sin ignited in Genesis 3 and a flame throughout history must be removed from God's presence and requires his judgment. Because all Adam and Eve's descendants, right, inherit their fallen nature, every human being is subject to God's judgment. God's son Jesus, the only perfect person to ever live, provides the only sufficient sacrifice to bear the judgment we all deserve. In our place, Jesus bore the full weight of the world's guilt and judgment so that through faith, we may have a restored relationship with God. When I do not believe in humanity's fall and judgment, I fool myself into believing I am innocent and am the ultimate judge of myself and the world. I fail to recognize my depravity and I miss the invitation of salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ. But when I believe in humanity's fall and judgment, I run to Jesus. I recognize my sin-soaked heart seek the Lord's forgiveness, repent of my sin, and receive the priceless gift of an eternal relationship with him. I am reborn into a new life and serve as an ambassador of God's heavenly kingdom. Amen. The fall of humanity cannot be ignored, and all people must face God's judgment. Sin is and compatible with God's perfect presence and therefore must be eradicated, ended, through his what? Judgment. Because God is perfect, his judgment is perfect and righteous. How does understanding the perfect holiness of God impact the way you consider worship and pray to him? Jesus Christ bore the consequences of the fall, taking on God's judgment in our place. The gruesome nature of Jesus' death reflects the horrific state of every person's fallen heart that deserves the righteous judgment of God, our Creator. Only a perfect human sacrifice could provide the perfect substitute for fallen humanity. Jesus faced God's judgment of our sin. How do you express your appreciation to God considering the cost he paid for your restored relationship with him? Rather than God's punitive judgment, repentant believers receive new eternal life in Jesus. People once fallen in sin, raised in Jesus' resurrection power as God declares them righteous through what? Faith in his Son. Rather than eternal separation from the Father and Son because of the fall, believers enjoy the eternal relationship with God 
because of his right judgment. What do you look forward to when you think ahead of living in glory with Jesus, your Savior, in your heavenly home, his kingdom? So ladies, as we look at uh, verses 31 through 37, this provides a moving picture of events surrounding the crucifixion and Jesus Christ revealing profound truths about the fulfillment of prophecy, the sacrificial nature of love, and the compassionate response of believers. As we dig deeper into this passage, we uncover layers of significance that encourage our understanding of God's redemptive plan and challenges us to live out his implications in our lives. Amen. So let's look here as we look at the fulfillment of prophecy. In verse 31, it begins with the urgency of moving the bodies of those crucified before the Sabbath, reflecting the careful observance of Jewish religious customs. This highlights the connection between divine timing and human tradition. It highlights the sovereignty of God over all earthly affairs. The soldier's decision not to break Jesus' legs fulfills the prophecy found in Psalms 34:20, affirming Jesus' identity as the unblemished Lamb of God whose sacrificial death brings salvation to humanity. This fulfillment emphasizes the divine orchestration of events, demonstrating God's faithfulness to his word throughout history. John emphasizes the significance of Jesus' unbroken bones as a symbolic confirmation of his identity as the promised Messiah. This imagery, it draws the parallels of the Passover lamb, whose bones were not to be broken. We saw that in Exodus 12, 46, and reinforces Jesus' role as the ultimate Passover sacrifice, delivering humanity from the bondage of sin and death. Amen. So let's look at the symbolism of the piercing. And we're looking at that in verse 34 through 37. The piercing of Jesus' side by the soldier spear serves as a moment of revelation, symbolizing the outpouring of Jesus' blood for the forgiveness of sins, shown throughout the flow of blood from his side. This is important because only a perfect human being could pay the price for humanity's sin. If Jesus were simply, what, unconscious and then later recovered, right? Then he did not pay the penalty for sin. And he was, what, not resurrected. Jesus died a real death. The factual proof in John validates Jesus' resurrection upon which the gospel stands. Hallelujah. This takes us to our, that's worth clapping. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. This takes us to our first principle, ladies. Believers can stand confidently in the certainty of Jesus' death. John's eyewitness testimony of these events affirms the historical reality of Jesus' death and resurrection. His emphasis on the fulfillment of prophecy and the symbolism of Jesus' sacrifice highlights the theological importance of these events for believers. So here's the truth, ladies. Meeting Jesus is an invitation to believe. There's a lie that some believe that some people are beyond hope of believing. Some may think, some may look at the cold heart, heartedness of the soldiers who broke the legs of the criminals and pierced the side of Jesus and claim that these men are proof that some people will never believe, regardless of 
the evidence or witness, and even if they meet Jesus in person, some would never come to faith in him. It is true that many encounter Jesus, and what? They refuse to believe in him. But as long as any person is alive, even the most hardened criminal, those who carry out injustice, or the most devout persecutor, there is hope for his heart to turn to Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Amen. That's right. Never give up hope. If you have family members and friends, you keep praying for them. Call out their name and claim them as body of Christ. Hallelujah. Who is your, who in your life seems beyond hope to believe in Jesus? How can you pray for them? Where do you need to trust God with the people you love? As we embrace the sovereignty of God, the fulfillment of prophecy in Jesus' crucifixion reminds us of God's sovereign control over human what? History. Trusting in his wisdom, not our own, but his wisdom, amen, enables us to find peace and hope in life's uncertainties. Reflect on the sacrificial love of Christ. Jesus' unbroken bones and pierced side symbolize his sacrificial love for humanity. Meditating on the depths of his love compels us to respond with what? Gratitude. Humility and selflessness in our relationships and service to others. Respond with repentance and faith. The piercing of Jesus' side calls us to acknowledge our sinfulness and embrace the forgiveness offered through his atoning sacrifice. By turning away from sin and placing our faith in Christ, we experience the transformative power of his grace and become agents of reconciliation in a broken world. Amen. So ladies, let's look at uh, the verses 38 through 42. We witness the sincere and tender moments following the crucifixion of Jesus, the burial of the Son of God. This passage reveals truths about the response of faithful disciples, the compassion of unlikely allies, and the anticipation of the resurrection hope. Let us journey through this narrative exploring its nature of being of meaning and drawing out practical application for our lives today. So, ladies here, we see the man Joseph. I think it's Ermatha. I don't know, but that's okay. Hallelujah. He's a prominent member of the Jewish council, right? And he steps forward with courage and compassion to request the body of who? Jesus for burial. Despite the risk of his what? Reputation and status. Joseph's actions demonstrate his unwavering commitment to honor Jesus in his death. Joseph's willingness to publicly align himself with Jesus challenges us to examine our own commitment to Christ. Are we willing to stand boldly for our faith, even when it requires sacrifice or goes against social expectations, right? All right. So we know, as we get to Nicodemus, that Joseph and Nicodemus, they were, what, secret disciples. Joseph's act of burial not only fulfills the Jewish custom of showing respect to the deceased, but it also fulfills scripture, which prophesied that the Messiah would be buried with the rich. We saw that in Isaiah 53, 9. So ladies, this takes us to our second principle. Believers express their faith by honoring Jesus. Believers express their faith by honoring Jesus. So Nicodemus 
is another member of the Jewish council who had previously visited Jesus under the cover of night. We saw that in John 3, verses 1 through 21. He joins Joseph in preparing Jesus' body for burial. His presence is significant. A transformation from what? A secret disciple to an open follower of Christ. The generous offering of myrrh and aloes by Nicodemus reflects his reverence for Jesus and his desire to honor him in death. Jesus' body was anointed with 75 pounds of spices, including myrrh and aloe, reflecting the gifts of the Magi at his birth. We saw that in Matthew 2, 9 through 11. Not only did Jesus body not decay. You can look that up, ladies, in Psalm 1610. The tomb was also new, and that's in Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 60. So no decaying bodies were in the tomb. This act of devotion challenges us to consider how we can use our resources, right? Our platforms, our resources to honor Christ and serve in his kingdom purposes. Nicodemus' partnership with Joseph highlights the power of solidarity in the face of what? Adversity. When believers come together in unity, regardless of their backgrounds, hallelujah, or differences, they bear witness to the transformative power of Christ. I put a little note in here because it made me think of all my sisters in Christ that I've served with uh, in, in this role the last three years. It is amazing. We look like heaven and we act like heaven too. Praise God. So the place of burial, a garden tomb. We're going to see that in uh, verses 41 through 42. Jesus is laid to rest in a nearby tomb in the garden. This is fulfilling yet another prophecy that the Messiah would be buried in a rich man's tomb. We see that in Isaiah 50, uh, 53, 9. Uh, this setting provides a contrast to the shame and humiliation of Jesus' crucifixion, foreshadowing the hope of what? The resurrection and the new life. The garden tomb serves as an important reminder that Jesus often brings beauty and life out of places of death and despair. In Isaiah 61.3, the scripture says, And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. It symbolizes the promise of renewal and restoration that awaits all who place their faith in Christ. Isn't that nice to know? He gives us beauty for our ashes. Praise the Lord. The act of uh, burying Jesus in the garden invites us to reflect on the significance of, the gar of gardens throughout what? Scripture and places of encountering that we encounter God. And it reminds us of what? His faithfulness, right? So you think about some of the gardens of your life and think about the faithfulness of God. It calls us to cultivate spaces of spiritual growth and intimacy with God in our own lives. Ladies, if we ain't got nothing else this year, we got Jesus. Amen. I want to leave you with this takeaway. God positions his disciples on what? Purpose. Hallelujah. Don't believe the lie that God cannot use ordinary men. Ha! <laughs> He's so good. As Christians, we can think God truly uses only those who are called into ministry or as missionaries. 
we can sometimes despise those who are insecure and damaged by doubts and fears. Joseph likely feared losing his privileges and power, yet privately was devoted to Christ. We can fall into ranking others because their faith or work for Jesus is better or stronger than others' faith or work. Joseph is described as a secret disciple of Jesus. Both he and Nicodemus were perfectly positioned, perfectly positioned to be used by God, to be used by God to ask for and receive Jesus' body to fulfill God's prophetic and sovereign plan. Hallelujah. A perfect God uses imperfect men where he positions them to accomplish his perfect what? Purposes. Hallelujah. Would you describe yourself as someone, as someone you think God cannot use? I hope not. I hope there's nobody in the room who would describe themselves to that. How have you written off others because you think they are too weak in spirit to be used by God? Like Joseph, let us courageously stand in our faith in the face of opposition, and as the young folks say, in face of the ops, ask your grandchildren, or risk to our reputation. Follow the example of Nicodemus by using our resources to honor Christ and serve others in what? Love and generosity. So ladies, in conclusion, just as Jesus was buried in a garden tomb, Let us embrace the hope of resurrection and new life, trusting in God's promise of renewal and restoration. As we meditate on this passage, may we be inspired to live with courageous faith. Hallelujah. Generous compassion. Hallelujah. And unwavering hope. Hallelujah. And the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do we drop the mic? No. (laughs) Oh, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you because you are the only true and living God. It is in Jesus Christ alone that we put our faith. Amen.